just going to talk now about, I think, a little bit of how QRP Labs got started and uh, a tour of the facility here. I call it facility. It's the attic in my house. And um, then I hope it will be interesting and uh, we can afterwards have some questions and discussion about anything, anybody who wants to ask anything. So QRP Labs goes back to, and there's a big article I wrote about this, and um, maybe I should publish the link to it somewhere or the PDF about the history of my involvement with weak signal modes and uh, QRSS, um, DFCW, FS, FSKCW, the weak signal modes which existed even before Whisper. And I started playing with at the end of 2003, beginning of 2004, and um, played with for several years. And uh, people were using software like Argo to receive the weak signal modes. And then in 2009, I was, uh, my, it was my first trip to Dayton uh, for the Hamvention. And I was inducted into the QRP Archie Hall of Fame that year in 2009. And uh, the reasons were basically because of the website which I had created, hansummers.com, which people found had a lot of useful and interesting information and projects that were fun to build. And so, the and then I was invited the following year, 2010, to give a presentation on weak signal modes, QRSS, which is basically Morse, but sent very slowly, um, so that it can be decoded with a very narrow bandwidth. So typically Morse with a 12 words per minute would be a 0 0.1 seconds dit length. Whereas for QRSS, we use uh, dit lengths in the order of three seconds, 10 seconds, sometimes even longer. And so that year, a good friend of mine, Steve, Golf Zero X-Ray Alpha Romeo, uh, Romeo uh, who lives in England, of course, and uh, he suggested, well, why don't we build a kit for you to take to accompany your talk? And so, that's what I did. I, I built this, um, uh, I don't think I've got any examples here to show you. Well, I do, but they're buried under several layers of debris, um, which I'll show you in a minute. You'll see it's not exactly a tidy desk that I have here. And he said, said, so why don't we make a QRSS kit? And it turned out that the previous summer, my wife and I had gone to uh, Grenada for a uh, Caribbean holiday, and I'd taken with me this uh, QRSS transmitter which just sent my call sign or three three characters of my call sign uh, so my call sign is Golf Zero Uniform from Papa Lima but it was just sending UPL um, in FSK CW over and over very slowly uh, with about 100 milliwatts and the whole thing fit into not even an Altoids tin it was even smaller than that it was a tiny mint tin about this size and so I decided to produce a kit of that circuit for the, to accompany my talk at Dayton 2010. And we made a hundred and I sold them for $15 each. And everybody loved the kit and they sold out that evening at vendors evening at Dayton FDIM. And there may be some people here who actually have one of that kit or who know of it, um, I don't know. And so that was how QRP Labs got started. And then over the years, um, we, we didn't. We, we carried on producing that kit for a couple of years, and then um, somebody in the UK copied that kit and produced something very similar, which was very annoying. And um, you know, we typically think that copying type of activities are going to come from the Far East, but this was something that came very close to home. And so, after getting upset about it for a while, um, I decided it was better to get even than get mad, and so as the saying goes, or maybe you know the saying better. And um, so what we did was, um, can just one moment, there's a question in the chat here I can see about uh, the Zoom meeting. Let me just put the meeting details in here. So uh, I designed to design a whisper transmitter, which was the ultimate, it was called the ultimate QRSS whisper transmitter that did whisper and, and very many other weak signal modes. And then uh, over the years that evolved and, and uh, in early 2013, um, I continued with QRP labs on my own 
uh, Steve Geo Zero XAR had uh, various other things going on. And so I decided to continue on my own. And from that point, it became a much more serious enterprise. And um, I was really trying to put some effort into developing new kits and uh, increasing the sales and, and make it into a serious little business, side business as it was then, because I was living in Tokyo, Japan, um, working in a bank in Japan. And that was my kind of evening business. And so it evolved into the Ultimate 2 and the Ultimate 3S and eventually uh, became the whole series of kits which you know of today. Um, and the sales just kept growing. And I was doing this stuff in my evenings and weekends and sitting on the floor of my small apartment in Tokyo, packing kits and packing towards into low pass filter kits and all of these things. And it just gradually grew and grew until mid 2016. Um, my wife and I decided that we would, uh, that I could do QRP labs full time. And uh, then we moved to Turkey. So we've been living in Turkey for the last four years. And in, here in Turkey, we have a house and uh, the top floor is the attic. And that's where the lab office shack is located and uh, for QRP labs. So I will show you around a bit and uh, then I'll show you some of my projects and toys and some of the things I'm working on. And then we can have some Q&A after that. And by the way, the current uh, office, lab, shack, however you want to call it, for QRP labs, the area is about 35 square meters, which in square feet is about 350 square feet. In Tokyo, uh, where I was developing the Ultimate 2, the Ultimate 3, the Ultimate 3S, and many of the QRP labs kits uh, pre the QCX, of course, but the, the clock kit, the VFO kit, the SI5351A synthesizer kit, the OCXO kit, all of these kits were developed in Tokyo. And there, my lab shack office was the bedroom closet. And it was five by four feet. So it was a total area of 1.8 square meters, 18 square feet. It was just approximately five by four feet. 1.8 square meters and I could go in there and close the door and there was a light in there and I had a tiny desk and my racks of components and a shelf with my oscilloscope on it and all of this stuff and a really really tiny little area and um, then obviously when we came here and I had 35 square meters uh, for a long while I was just kind of rattling around in here and didn't know what to do with it but as QRP Labs has continued to grow, then so has the space got consumed. And we do now have a lot of stock, which is all um, stacked up here. So let me show you around. First, I will change the camera to the front camera view. First, let me show you outside the door. This was, I don't know if you can see here on the stairs, not very well because it's quite dark out here, but where is the camera? So this is the sign we have outside the door, QRP Labs Research and Development Laboratory. And a friend of mine in the UK has a engraving facility and engraved that for me. So it's a nice sign we have outside the door. It's a pity the lights don't work in the hallway there. Now over here, I can show you a whole view from one end to the other. And you can see it, it is now very cluttered in here. Um, it's no longer the case that I'm rattling around in here with only myself. If I could figure out where the camera is on this, it would help because I won't put my finger in front of it. Okay. So here on the, in this kind of corner around the corner here is the stock of QRP labs kits, which are all packed up and ready to go. And um, this is a, shelf arrangement which I built myself one Sunday afternoon. Um, it's actually made from the same leftover material. Back again. So this shelf unit was built from leftover planks from the roof, from the ceiling, but they'd been outside for 
quite some time so they've got terribly weathered but anyway i left it like that because it's quite kind of uh, warehouse style and so then we bought all these plastic uh, containers of various sizes to hold the kits so you can see here's the qcx plus kit ready to go out and uh, dummy load pa kit relay switch filter kit all of the low pass filters for the various bands are up here and band pass filters here and so on smaller components are in this very small trays here then we have uh, some large coils of wire down here now i should say that we source the components for the qrp labs kits uh, many of them come from china um, some of them come from america depending on the components so there are things like the np0 capacitors which we now source only from america uh, from digikey because the quality is very high and it's very important for the low pass filters and the power output not to be attenuated by lossy capacitors the torrids we get from uh, kits and parts uh, in america too the wire here we started getting that locally from turkey because uh, the cost of shipping wire internationally or the cost of shipping anything internationally works out to be about ten dollars per kilo now I can buy this wire in Turkey for ten dollars per kilo just for the wire, let alone having any shipping on it. So it obviously works out cheaper for things like that to be able to buy them locally. Then over here we have uh, lots of stock of uh, QRP Labs kits. So, for example, what we have here is all the you remember the LCD modules. Some of you may know. The LCD modules that came with the first batch of QCX Plus kits were actually the, the supplier changed the model of the LCD module and it was too thick. So these are the old LCD modules which we have to send back at some point. And then there's more stock. For example, here are the, here are the heat sinks um, that we use for the 50 watt power amplifier. This is the same heat sink used in the 10 watt linear. <coughs> So originally the 10 watt linear used a raw aluminium heatsink, but we've now upgraded that to this um, black anodized version, which is slightly more expensive for me to produce, but it's um, nicer looking and more durable uh, to scratching and so on. So this is a custom made, manuf custom manufactured heat sinks with the holes drilled exactly in the right places for the 50 watt power amplifier and the 10 watt linear kits. So here, for example, is some, sorry, the lighting is not very good in this corner, unfortunately. There's more of the 50 watt linear kit here. So this is, you know, just some of the, some of the stock we have. Um, massive reel of NP0 capacitors here from, from DigiKey. Um, so you can see this is the main area where the kits are, when they're packed, they're going in here and uh, some art from my son stuck on the edge here <laughs> so um and then on the top we've got the uh, ic's we buy the atmega 328s by the by the thousand uh, for the qcx kits and program them all here um then over here at this desk is where uh rabia sits rabia is a local lady um she lives only 100 or 200 meters from here and she's been working with us for the last six months or so and she handles all the kitting and all the packing of the kits that needs to be done and um, she has some stock of QCX components here so anything that's missing um, it's easy to send it out to customers um, so she sits here and on the wall we have some specification of how the kit components are to be packed and a package of bags for different setups and all of our paperwork filing goes on, on this shelf here. Uh, things like invoices and accounts for taxes and so on, all boring stuff. Now I turn around and look back this way. Um, here is our printer. We went through some sagas with printer. I had a laser jet printer, but it stopped working after about a year and a half. Um, which was very annoying and it was an HP printer an expensive printer and uh, 
and they said it was going to last for a lot longer than that. So this is now an inkjet printer. We changed to an inkjet printer and uh, it's working very well so far and it's actually faster and cheaper to run than the laser was. Now on this desk, which is, so my workbench here is uh, 14 feet long. Now I forget the meters equivalent now for those of you in metric land. Um, I'm very mixed up between meters and feet. But anyway, this is the, the main workbench, which was custom manufactured for me when we moved here. And it's all built out of uh, 30 millimeter, uh, 30 millimeter MD, thick MDF. So it's really strong. And in the corner section where I have my desk there at the end, I can actually sit on the corner section, which has no supports under it and it doesn't flex at all, so it's really well built. And uh, I specified it that way because I knew there was going to be some heavy equipment on some areas of it. And all the way along the back of the bench, there's a shelf 30 centimeters up, um, which gives me additional places to put test equipment and storage. Now you'll see this is a horrible mess, and um, I was thinking of tidying it up for this, but then I thought I shouldn't uh, pretend anything um, this is really how it is <laughs> so on the top here we have uh, some of my old projects uh, this was actually a miniature computer i built um using a old uh, five inch television screen which i reverse engineered and built all of the driver circuits for again on matrix board and an atminger 2568 2560 processor and it runs an interpreted uh, basic language um, it was quite fun did that when I was in Tokyo so I have here some of my uh, ice cream actually when you look at the amount of ice cream I've eaten over the years it's quite astonishing these are all ice cream containers cot door ice cream from the years when I was in London and so they accompanied me to Tokyo and then from Tokyo to Turkey and uh, they contain some of the bigger components and uh, projects. So this desk position here, now you can see it's a lot more too tidy for something that would be where I would sit. Um, I would never have such a tidy desk as that. This is for our second employee. He's a 25-year-old man called Sinan who has some uh, good electronic skills and uh, so he's helping me, for example, when I need a prototype built, it saves some time that he does it for me. And he also assembles QCX kits, now QCX Plus kits. So here we see a variety of QCX Plus kits, which are in various phases of completion. Um, they're all of them awaiting enclosures. And so we're taking orders for QCX Plus in assembled form, which has an additional fee of $45 for the assembly. So you see here we've got, uh, these ones are, this one's waiting for a display, for example. And uh, so there's uh, a number of QCX kits. These ones are all ready to go out. They just need their enclosure to be added. Um, on here, we've got some 50 watt power amplifiers, which he's assembled as well. Um, one of the things that we did recently was the 50 watt power amplifier was originally designed for 40, 30 or 20 meters to be built for any of those bands. But there's a way to be able to use the capacitor in parallel to build it for 80 meters. So he's built one of those for 80 meters for testing purposes too. Um, so that's something we're going to be doing soon. Then you can see at various places in the back, some of the awards I have. This was my first award from the GQRP Club in 2004, which was the W1FB Memorial Trophy. W1FB was a, a very avid QRP -er who's uh, very much respected by the GQRP group in the UK. Then this was my plaque for entry into the uh, QRP Archie Hall of Fame. Now we are going to move, hopefully we're going to be moving house in the next few months and um, when we move to the new place, we'll again have an office in the attic, uh, probably slightly bigger than this one, and 
hopefully I can be better organized about having somewhere to put the nice award plaques as well. This was my most recent one, which was uh, for the CW Ops Award for in Dayton 2019 for the, uh, basically for the QCX kit, which had introduced so many people to the, to the art of CW who hadn't previously done it. Um, everywhere dotted throughout the lab, you can see various uh, unfinished projects. This was a 10 tube communications receiver with a Jackson Brothers reduction dial, um, which was a design by my father who passed away in 1988. And he had some tubed communication receivers before that. So I started rebuilding that. It must have been more than 10 years ago because it was when we were still living in the UK and it still hasn't been finished. So <laughs> not getting very far with that. And I've got a Heathkit signal generator here. I've actually got two Heathkit signal generators. One is behind here and belonged to my father. And neither of them work. Um, but having two of them, there's some theory that at some point I might be able to take enough working parts from both of them to be able to make one working version. That's the plan anyway. Then I have this oscilloscope. So when I moved from Japan um, in 2016, mid 2016, um, I couldn't imagine being without an oscilloscope for uh, 10 weeks that it was going to take our shipping container to be shipped all the way from Japan to Turkey. And at that point, I had an analog oscilloscope. And so I decided I would buy a digital oscilloscope just so that it could be fit in my suitcase. So we came over from Japan to Turkey, and I had in my suitcase a small cardboard box, which was like my electronic survival kit. And I had in there the uh, two kilograms uh, 01 100 megahertz oscilloscope, as well as the uh, a small box of components and my soldering iron, a small power supply and things like that. So it was intended to be my survival kit so I could continue developing things during the uh, 10 weeks we were waiting for the shipping container to arrive. Um, so that was, that was that. Now, the next oscilloscope is a much more recent addition. And this is also a digital scope. This is a Siglent 200 megahertz scope. And this was a award, a prize award. Um, in 2019, I was awarded the Homebrew Heroes Award for 2019, which is a new award. So it was I was actually the inaugural awardee for that. And this is a 200 megahertz oscilloscope from Siglent, which is one of the sponsors for the award. So that was a nice free one. And that's actually the one I use most at the moment. Um, I find it has the best accuracy. Um, what is it measuring here? Ah, oh, yes. I was doing an experiment with some special coding on this 1602 LCD display to try and make it do something it wasn't supposed to do. And that's the waveform from that. Um, so the, the only problem I have with this oscilloscope, it's actually a lot more capable than the O1 100, 100 megahertz scope next to it. The only issue I have is that the the Cursor measurements are quite small font and hard to read uh, for me anyway. Um, I find it much easier to read the larger font on the O1. So <clears throat> I'll just switch that off. And coming over a little bit further, this is um, my 40 meter QCX, which has a 50 watt uh, power amplifier attached to it in the same box. It's actually the prototype of the 50 watt power amplifier. As you can see, the lid is off at the moment. I was doing some modifications to it recently and didn't quite finish them and put the lid back on again. So uh, this was installed in an enclosure which I bought at some point during my time in Japan. And uh, I have no idea what I originally bought it for, but it was all nice and ready here. So I decided to put it to good use. And so this is a 40 meter QCX with the 50 watt power and fire attached to it. And I also have it attached the audio so there's a, a 3.5 millimeter jack on the front here. And if I plug in my headphones there, I get to hear the audio in the headphones. If I leave it out, it routes the audio to an RCA socket on the back, which is then connected to this audio amplifier. So I can actually switch this on. 
and you might be able to hear that straight away. Um, so that's on 7020, 7.020 on the QCX. And you can probably hear that on the audio. So when I have that switch to here, this is a <coughs> an audio amplifier, which I bought a board from AliExpress from China and I just put it in that enclosure. And it's just connected to a pair of speakers in the shack. So when I have visitors to the shack and I want to demonstrate, then I can just switch that audio on. Um, it actually has four input channels, so I could switch four different radios to it and uh, be able to uh, demonstrate those to, the, to anybody who's in the shack visiting. And we don't get very many amateur radio visitors, um, but we do get quite a few people who are curious about what is amateur radio and my wife brings her friends up sometimes and they're curious and they ask questions and so um, it's nice to be able to demonstrate that. So underneath that is a power supply which I bought specially for the development as a 50 watt power amplifier. This is a 0 to 30 volts, 0 to 20 amp linear regulated power supply. I have a great um, issue with switch mode power supplies that often I get noise from them. And so these days, I, I, you know, I appreciate the smaller size of switch mode power supplies compared to linear regulated supplies. And I appreciate the um, efficiency savings, but I don't really appreciate the RF noise, which they can generate and often do generate. And I know there are quiet ones and there are noisy ones, but it's hard to know which is which, especially before you've purchased them. And so these days I don't take any chances and I just go for a linear supply and, and um, it uses more power and it gets hotter, but I don't really care because it's, it's very RF quiet. So that's why I like that. So previous to that, I had been using this um, five amp. Similarly, it's a linear supply. Um, and I had been using that for the QCX development and various other developments, but now I'm using this much more powerful version because the um, QCX plus with its 50 watt power amplifier was a little bit more than the five amps which could be delivered by the other supply. So this rig is actually what I've had most of my uh, QSOs on over the last year, year and a half. It's a 40 meters CW and um, you know with 50 watts I really can enjoy improving my CW in the very rare times that I do get to go on air. Um, I don't think I've had more than about 500 QSOs in the last 18 months. Um, something like that, and most of them be have been on this 40 meter rig. And there's a switch on the front too, which I can switch between. Um, sorry, where is that wire coming from? I can switch that between five watts uh, like that and 50 watts like that. And uh, so I use the five watts for the QRP Labs QCX QSO party, and 50 watts if I want to practice my CW and improve a bit. I've QSO'd with this radio to Japan, which is 9,000 kilometers, and to New Zealand, which is even further afield, and to America in the other direction, and all over Europe and everywhere in between. So I really love the QCX. I know I'm biased because I designed it, but I do actually really love using it too. Really nice radio to use. So that's the QCX 40. Then under the desk, I have my great big computer. I was using previously a, a Dell all-in-one computer, which sat here on the shelf. And uh, at some point, the antenna wire, which you see runs up the side of the monitor here and goes out through a window in the ceiling, got caught behind the monitor and pulled the monitor off the desk, off the shelf, and it went splat onto the table and landed on the QSX, the forthcoming QSX development which had no damage whatsoever, but the monitor got smashed. And being an all-in-one computer, once you smash the monitor, you smash the entire computer. You can't just replace the monitor. And so that was the last time I ever bought an all-in-one computer. So then I went to buy the uh, normal sort of desktop format. And um, I also switched to using Linux rather than Windows 10, just because uh, Windows 10 had really got slow on me, and I don't know why, because there are lots of people who are very happy with it, but uh, I switched to using Linux, because uh, then I'm always uh, 
it just, you know, I really just want an operating system that hides in the background and doesn't bother me. And uh, Windows 10 had stopped doing that. Windows 10 was uh, getting really slow on me. So as soon as I switched to Linux, there was a little bit of a uh, learning curve to do uh, to find out the applications which were um, equivalent to the ones I had been using in Windows. But overall, it was quite a smooth process and I'm quite happy with the result. I'm also using now this uh, very noisy keypad, uh, keyboard with real tactile switches. And um, I prefer that very much to the old Dell keyboard, which I had before, where you just press it and it squidges and you don't really hear any sound or any feedback. So I quite like that. Then um, over here, you can see I actually have a mix up of power connectors. And that's because in Japan, they use the same power connector as America uses. And so a whole bunch of my equipment uses Japanese power connectors, um, including my oscilloscopes and these iPad chargers, which were bought in America too in Dayton 2018. Um, so I have a bunch of stuff that runs on American plugs. I have a bunch of stuff that runs on Turkish plugs, which are the European style, round style. And I have a bunch of stuff from the UK, which needs UK plugs. And so all of that is horribly wound up somewhere behind or here. Everything is wired up together, plugged in somewhere and with various adapters and nothing has caught fire yet. So um, that means of course, that it never will caught, catch fire, right? And so that's the story with the power adapters. Now I have here a quite old uh, component uh, drawer cabinet where I have most of the components which I use day to day resistors, capacitors, transistors, that kind of thing. I also have this much older component tray, which I bought in the UK from Maplin Electronics when I was something like 14 or 15 years old. So it's really old, but um, it's a steel construction and very good quality and it's survived all of these years. So it's uh, quite amazing. This power supply, I am um, built myself uh, it's a five amp five volt five amp and 12 volt five amp linear regulated supply and so um, i use that one for a lot of things too oh yes you can see the uh, world domination headquarters sign underneath it this was printed by the same friend who printed the qrp labs label i showed you which is out on the wall outside the door uh, before i before we came in now under the under the shelf here this is a 20 meters whisper receiver. It's actually made of a QRP Labs receiver module and a QRP Labs prog rock module. And it has a jack socket on the back where I can plug in the QLG1 GPS module for frequency discipline. And I use this for um, whisper reception on 20 meters. And I built it specifically because I wanted to track the uh, high altitude balloons that were launched by Dave BE3KCL. We've been collaborating for a number of years on balloon trackers. And uh, this receiver is a very high performance receiver. And with, um, you, you know, there's this uh, website, Whisper Challenge, which ranks uh, receivers in terms of how many unique stations they've received in a 24 hour period. And with this receiver setup, I'm always in the top 50 of the uh, whisper challenge for 20 meters. Um, and so I think at one point I was, you know, in the top 10 or something, which, and some of the stations who are in that are using really um, high performance stations costing tens of thousands of dollars with steerable multi-element beam antennas put all set up in the right direction and everything for the best performance. And so it was, uh, it's really, satisfying to be able to get into that top uh, table with such a simple low cost thing made from QRP Labs kits. Then um, there's a number of test fixtures which I've built myself over the last year or so. Um, these are some of the things I've built. Um, this is a, I'll try and get this properly. This is a step attenuator and it's all built of uh, PCB, unetched PCB. It's a step attenuator which I use uh, for sensitive receiver measurements and I have this 20 dB 
five watt rated attenuator um, for looking at, because you can't connect a transmitter output directly into a spectrum analyzer because you just fire the input to the spectrum analyzer. And then this one was a test fixture I built for phase noise. So there's an article on the QRP Labs website about the SI53518A5 phase noise and, and ways to measure that and improve that. And this was the text fixture I built for that. Then this was a interesting project. This is a um, seven megahertz. It's got a nine volt battery inside. Let me switch it on with this uh, toggle switch here. And this is a mm. seven megahertz signal generator which has a very precise level. It has two outputs here, sine wave outputs, one of which is zero dBm and one is minus 60 dBm. And I made a YouTube video about this. Um, it's not a project that's on the website, but it, it's a, there's a YouTube video about it. And it's a, a very useful calibration test source, um, which is useful for you know, checking 40 meter receivers. But I also, I mainly used it to check the calibration of my oscilloscopes and my spectrum analyzer. So I haven't been to the spectrum analyzer yet. This is the spectrum analyzer, which I use. Um, just switch that on there. This is an Advantest R3361C, uh, 2.6 gigahertz spectrum analyzer with 50 ohm input and also a tracking generator uh, with uh, 50 ohms output and uh, it's a very useful piece of equipment. I built, I bought this at the uh, Tokyo ham fair in 2013. Um, it was 65,000 yen, which in dollar terms is about $600, something like that. This was a unit which was built, I think in 1995. And back in 1995, these were selling for about $20,000. So, it's, um, of course, nowadays, if you buy a spectrum analyzer, you can get very much lower cost new spectrum analyzers with very high performance. But um, so I've been using this for the last seven years and uh, it goes, it works very well. And above that is my old analog oscilloscope. This is a 100 megahertz oscilloscope and it has a, um, but it's kind of at the, boundary between the digital age and the analog age because it's got all it's all digitally controlled by a microprocessor inside and um, it has on-screen cursors that measure the voltage difference between two lines which you can move up and down very much like a modern digital storage oscilloscope and uh, it has an on-screen frequency counter measurement as well the interesting thing about this was that it's a three-channel oscilloscope and uh, they're not that common three-channel oscilloscopes but since we moved to Turkey from Japan, I've never actually used this because you know, I'm very happy with my um, digital oscilloscopes here that I'm using now for almost everything. And also because the um, analog oscilloscope is, has a 100 volt supply voltage and no switch on the back. You know, most equipment has a switch on the back, so you can choose whether you want 100 volts or 220 volt supply. This has only 100 volt supply, which is what they use in Japan. The power system in Japan is 100 volts. Interesting story about this oscilloscope. Um, I paid the equivalent of about $5 for it at the Tokyo Ham Fair, same one where I bought this uh, 2000, this uh, spectrum analyzer. And the oscilloscope, um, there was a, it was on the last day of the Ham Fair and it was right before closing time. And I was admiring a test equipment seller, secondhand test equipment, and all of his equipment was unbelievably I couldn't understand any of it I was looking at all of these massive pieces of test equipment with tons of buttons all over the front and communications analyzers cell tower <coughs> test equipment I have no idea what and I couldn't understand any of what any of it was for and so I was just admiring some of this stuff and trying to figure it out and suddenly I, I don't know if, uh, if we have anyone from Jap Japan here but Japanese people are very polite and they don't like to intrude on each other's space and physical contact. And they're very polite and gentle and generally calm. But suddenly I was standing there in front of this test equipment seller and I was being pushed in all directions and there was a massive commotion all around me. And 
I couldn't work out what had happened. And so I just, in my shock, I just uh, couldn't understand what had happened. And I just said to the nearest guy to me, what happened? And he said, well, this, the owner of this stand just announced that everything on this stand, every piece of test equipment on this stand is going to be sold for 500 yen, which is about $5. And so that was what had caused commotion. It was like feeding time at the zoo. Everyone thought they were going to grab a nice piece of te test equipment for five dollars, and so I grabbed this oscilloscope, which was right in front of me, and I, you know, that was um, that was how I came by that nice, nice piece of equipment. Um, that was also interesting because uh, I was then trying to carry these two very heavy items on the subway system and on the train home from the home uh, Tokyo Ham Fair. My wife was waiting at home, and she was heavily pregnant with our first daughter. And you know, when people are heavily pregnant, their patience is not necessarily as high as it normally is. And so I was somewhat nervous walking up to the door with these two enormous pieces of test equipment that I spent quite some money on, at least the spectrum analyzer I had. And so, um, but you know, the other thing is, there's a lot of randomness involved in, the, in this time of uh, pregnancy too. So there was no knowing what I was going to encounter, but in, in the end, it, was, it all went very well. And here they are still today. On top of that, I have um, this MSJ graphical spectrum analyzer, which is something which was also a prize for the Homebrew Heroes Award. Um, some really old stuff here. This is my father's uh, homemade voltmeter, which has got a label in it, 1970. Um, underneath that is a very heavy linear power supply 50 volts, 20 amps. It's a one kilowatt power supply linear and it weighs about 35 kilograms. Now over here on this side, um, there are a selection of equipment. This is a um, eight digit Nixie tube Heath kit frequency counter, which I bought at my first ever Dayton in 2009 in the flea market. Um, this frequency counter is one that I use uh, more often and uh, is a Raycal 9911. And it goes all the way up to VHF and is, is the one that I use most often. Um, over here, there are a selection of different uh, projects that I have built. By the way, this transmitter you see here is the one that I had my first ever QSO on in 2002. It's a one valve, uh, one tube transmitter, crystal controlled transmitter, producing about five watts on 80 meters. And underneath that, and I'm sorry I can't show this any better, but everything is very stacked up here in the mess that you see here, um, is my uh, 80 meter receiver that I built around about the same period, um, which was my first introduction to TALO detectors. You use the, the uh, quadrature sampling detector, which is now used in the QCX as well. In front of this, this is a CNC machine, which I had for my birthday uh, just over one year ago. And this came because um, I've always wanted to build a CNC machine, but I finally admitted I would never have time to do that. And I, so I wanted to, I then wanted to buy one. And um, I tried to buy one three or four years ago from AliExpress and uh, from China. And it didn't make it through Turkish customs. And I don't know what happened to it. I never heard anything about it. I never received it. And by the time I applied for my money back, the um, timeout had already elapsed. And so um, I never got my money back for that. But this now, this, this was my birthday present for my kids uh, just over a year ago. Um, my daughter said, hey, it's daddy's birthday. We're gonna have to take him to the toy shop and buy him a toy. <laughs> And, uh, you know, that's what happens to them when it's their birthday. And so they thought that's what they would do for me. And I said, well, I mean, maybe at the toy shop, we won't find the kind of toys that I want. Um, but, you know, we can do internet shopping. And this is the CNC machine that I want. So uh, they got that for me for my birthday. So that was quite nice. But I haven't used it. I used it for, I tried to do one um, PCB etch here. This is where I etched the... QRP lab slow pass filter board and I went through it took me about a day to work out all of the software tooling I would require to etch my own PCBs to mill my own PCBs rather from the uh, Eagle CAD to the 
uh, file outputs and produce the necessary G code to operate the CNC machine. But as you see, the results were not terribly good, um, rather uneven milling. And I decided I needed to do some upgrades to the machine. So I bought this uh, 250 watt motor, which was a lot more powerful than the one supplied with the machine. And I bought a speed controller um, and a digital readout for the speed controller. I spent some money on decent collets and milling bits and everything. And so at some point, I still need to spend the time to put all of those together, okay? Which I still haven't done. But the idea was I'd be able to mill some PCBs for some projects and maybe quicker than waiting for PCBs to be ordered from the PCB manufacturer. Then over here in these drawers, I have my uh, all my mechanical tools, which are greatly abused. My uh, AAD LC meter. Um, <coughs> then over here, you see the junk. This is various junk, which has followed me from London to Tokyo to Turkey, and has gradually been augmented with more and more junk as the time went by, as I collect it from everywhere probably none of it's ever going to be used. Um, then we have about 320 orders. These are all the boxes for QRP Labs customers who are waiting for their orders to be shipped. And on each of them is written what they're waiting for. Because of the very high volume of orders for QCX Plus, which replaces the QCX kit, we actually ran out of stock of a large number of things. And one of the things that we ran out of was the QCX Plus enclosure, because I manufactured 1,000 QCX kits and only 500 QCX Plus enclosures, sorry, 1,000 QCX Plus kits. And in the event, we've now sold almost, or just over 800 QCX Plus kits and around 90% of people have chosen to have the enclosure with it. And because of that, we ran out of the enclosures. So I had to have more enclosures made. And uh, these boxes were all waiting for the enclosures, along with these boxes here, and along with a bunch of other boxes. And um, I'll talk about those in a moment and the process that we go through to pack QRP Labs orders on a daily basis. And so now the good news, at least, is that this morning, we took delivery of 19 boxes from a, a FedEx delivery van, and 19 boxes were something about 320 kilograms of uh, enclosures and the QLG1 GPS PCBs, the 50 watt power amplifier PCBs. So we're now in stock of absolutely everything. And next week, we just have to shift out these uh, 300 boxes. So I reckon with about 80 per day, we can clear the backlog in a week. Um, and as I said, we, I do have the two people working with me Monday to Friday um, who sit over here. And so they should be able to, I think, clear the backlog in a week if they work hard and take less coffee breaks and less smoking breaks and all of these things. Then over here, most of these boxes just contain uh, various QRP Labs stock. Uh, for example, more 50 watt amplifier heat sinks, same heat sink is used. Now I have to manufacture these in batches of a thousand because they're custom manufactured for QRP labs. And um, so I have to, minimum order quantity is, is a thousand for those. And they also have quite a long lead time of four weeks. So I have to try and order those ahead of when we think we need them. Um, what else do we have here? These are also more enclosure kits. Um, so various stock as well as other junk. Now, before I finish, just a little bit about the procedure, how we go through uh, daily handling your orders when you place an order. Um, now that you've seen something about the arrangement of the office lab. Uh, so <clears throat> Here is my nice big screen, and on the left here I have my master spreadsheet, which contains all of the QRP Labs orders since March 2013, all of the names and all of the items of what they ordered. So I can use that to try and predict 
when I need to order new stock of components, such as uh, enclosures and uh, some of the PCBs that we manufacture and the components that we need. So many of the, as I said, many of the components are coming from China. Um, some of them are coming from America, in particular the NP0 capacitors and the toroids come from America. Some of the ICs come from America, like the SI 5351A. Um, at Mega 3 to 8 processors, we often buy from China or from America or from the UK sometimes, depending on uh, source and supply and how quickly we need them. And uh, so there's that spreadsheet, but we also have quite a lot of automation. Um, Rabia on, on her PC, on her laptop over here on the left, she has a spreadsheet that is quite highly automated and that reads in from the, so there's a database extract every day that comes from the, uh, every one hour, sorry, that comes from the QRP Labs order database. And it produces a, a several text file outputs, which, can be, which are imported by that spreadsheet and which then produce a list of what she needs to send out and also produce this um, automatically prepared label here. Um, so that's an example. So those, those get printed six sheets to a, six labels to a sheet on our printer here. And then the uh, kits get taken from the stock here that we've got prepared according to what's been chosen by the customer in the order. And they get packed up <coughs> and they get packed into these boxes and given to me here in a pile. And I do a final quality control check where I log into the shop database backend and I check what orders have been, what items have been chosen by the customer. And I have a look and make sure that the items that have been chosen match what they have packed. And it, because there's human error always, and we just try to prevent anything being missed. Because of course, if anything is missed, we have to send out the replacements. And of course, we have to pay the shipping uh, for the replacement parts. And often, you know, if there's one kit missed or a chip has been missed or something like that, then it's quite painful to have to pay $10 FedEx shipping uh, for a single capacitor or a single chip or something like that. So I do a quality control check. Uh, these are all waiting for my quality control check. They're also waiting for things like, you know, this in this case is order 37666, which is waiting for the 50 watt power amplifier aluminium enclosure. These all arrived here today, as I mentioned earlier, and they're currently sitting outside my front door waiting for Sinan to arrive on Monday. And little does he know, but he will be carrying those 19 boxes up the two flights of stairs to the attic. You know, he's a strong young guy. And uh, unlike me, I am uh, just turned 49 last week and uh, I have a slip disc in my back and there's no way I'm going to be carrying any of those boxes up those stairs. But little does he know, as soon as he gets here on Monday morning, he's going to be carrying those up the stairs and uh, we'll start packing. So all of these are, are, are orders which are waiting for something in those uh, boxes. Any customer who's ordered anything in the last uh, few weeks that is waiting for uh, items like the aluminum enclosure for the QCX Plus, they're all in this pile or in this stack of uh, boxes over here. So they'll all be shipped out in the next few days. So any customers who order something that we did have in stock, they are something that I've already checked on a daily basis and they've already been shipped out already. Uh, we tend to try to ship everything out within 24 hours. And so <coughs> any time that they have leftover from packing kits, um, Rabia and Sinan do kit assembly. And uh, there's some examples of the assembled QCX plus kits. These will be put into enclosures on Monday and shipped out to customers who are waiting for those. Um, Rabia is, a, a, you know, she doesn't have any electronics background, but she's very good at soldering and does a really thorough job. And uh, so far, all but one of the QCX kits that she's assembled have worked first time. Um, Sinan has uh, quite some soldering experience as a hobbyist and as a maker. And so he, uh, his soldering is also very good. And so these assembled kits we offer at $45 assembly fee. Um, I do have on the website a place to 
purchase those, but uh, we haven't enabled that because so far there have been so many inquiries for them that I just take the orders one by one. So there you go, just a quick summary the the stock or the prepared stock and of course when these run out they have to um, replace the kits and pack more um, from the supplies that we have in the boxes that we've got everywhere. We have, uh, you know, you've probably never seen so many Toros in your life. Something like 10,000 T37-6 Toros uh, from Diz at kitsandparts.com in America. And then in this box, these are all NP0 capacitors by the thousand from DigiKey. Um, by the way, we have to order them in quite large quantity because the customs clearance procedures here in Turkey are quite fierce and uh, you have to have a um, properly registered Turkish company and an import license. And the import license has to be consistent with the materials which you're trying to import. And you have to have an import clearance broker and everything has to be very carefully handled. And the import clearance broker will deal with Turkish customs authorities and decide how much you have to pay. And eventually all that, get, I mean, it, it actually takes one day to do all of that from when the items arrive in the country to when they get passed through customs. It's, it's very quick, but you do have to have a customs clearance broker and there's a fee per import, which is quite a high fee per import. So obviously you want to make sure that the import is as substantial as possible so that the uh, fee per component as such is as small as possible. So that's the end, I think, of my quick tour. Um, I hope it's been interesting and you can get some kind of idea of how the, where I spend most of my days. Um, and yeah, my main corner is the messiest corner here, as you can see, it's horrifically messy. But believe it or not, I can actually find most things fairly quickly. Um, I know where to put my hands on everything, uh, despite the apparent mess. So I'm going to put this tablet, which I stole earlier from my daughter, and she's not very happy about, back on its stand here. And I'll turn my camera back around to me. and. We can have some questions from people, anybody who wants to ask any questions about anything about QRP labs or any of the projects or any of the products, any of the products in development, um, anybody can ask some questions. So since everybody is in mute, I think the best thing to do, and there are quite a few people on the, quite a few participants here, I probably won't be able to see everybody on one screen, but I think the best thing to do would be, um, is there some way for people to, I think Zoom has a feature for people to put their hand up somehow or flag that they want attention. Is there